வெல்கம் வணக்கம் ஸ்வாகதம் ஜெய ஹிந்த் இஃப் யூ ஆஸ்க் மீ வாட்ஸ் தி ஃபன்னியஸ்ட் எக்ஸ்பீரியன்ஸ் அட்லீஸ்ட் ஃபார் மீ இன் டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் ஸோ ஃபார் திஸ் இயர் வித்வுட் ஹேவிங் டு திங்க் ஃபார் அ செகண்ட் ஐ ஹேவ் டு சே அண்ட் ஐ வில் சே that it is the controversy generated in the wake of uh, the prime minister joining the chief justice of india dr d y chandrachud in offering worship to lord ganesh uh, in the context of uh, ganesh chaturthi or ganesh festival to which great religious fervor and significance as we all know is attached clearly there are two polarized camps one straining its nerves to justify this particular episode the other trying to smell a rat in it i have to say that i don't belong to either of the camps if i had belonged to any one of them my doing this video would be completely superfluous i have nothing to add to the argument or the standpoint adopted by either of the two blocks and i certainly don't think the way they do the main purpose of this video is to share with you the reason why i feel obliged and take the liberty to th- to think differently on this issue as compared to every other person who has expressed his opinion on the matter in the public domain at least as can be gathered from the media visibility of this episode and the reactions to it so far i think one of the important factors here on which i don't want to lay much emphasis is um, the general impression about the prime minister that he does nothing without a purpose that he that there is an intention if he goes to the vivekananda memorial rock to meditate there is a political intent to it if he reaches out to certain a certain segment of the society there is a particular motive behind it if he goes abroad there is a certain motive behind it if he w- attends a wedding as he did in kerala he attended the wedding of uh, uh, one of the matani idols who also became a successful bjp candidate in the 2024 elections who is now a minister of state in the central government his name is suresh gopi the prime minister came all the way to kerala to guruvayur temple to attend the wedding of suresh gopi's daughter so in doing so his eyes were fixed on the electoral gains thereof so on and so forth this is a public perception i have very little to say on this matter because i have always believed that it's a bit risky to judge a person's intention because intention is always a hidden factor and the likelihood of one going seriously wrong in uh, sounding cocksure about a person's hidden intention is very high and i don't want to be uncharitable towards anyone uh, just as i don't want to be misunderstood in terms of my supposed motivations i've suffered a lot in this context that's also the reason why i'm reasonably circumspect about it so there is this widespread perception that if the prime minister stirs a little finger there is an electoral or political motive behind it that may or may not be true but i'm only saying there is one reason why the prime minister joining the chief justice of india on an occasion of religious significance like this has sent some kind of a 
if I may put it that way, shock waves in certain and quarters. And uh, I feel equally amused by the strenuous efforts made by the BJP camp to justify this and to rush to the defense of the Chief Justice of India as though the Chief Justice of India is their private property. That again adds to the suspicion. In fact, it would have been much better, it would have been far more sensible if these stalwarts had refrained from the righteous duty to defend the, uh, what uh, has happened in the house of the Chief Justice of India. And I also wish that the media had not uh, broadcast it far and wide. Uh, it should have been treated as a private uh, uh, event. After all, worship is a private event. Um, any worship treated as fodder for publicity is a mockery of worship. And I believe that it is an insult to the majesty of the particular deity's holiness or sanctity. So I believe that by dragging it through the media dirt, this act of worship offered to Lord Ganesha has been virtually desecrated. And I'm surprised that uh, Hindus who care for their faith and the uh, ardent devotees of Lord Ganesha completely overlook or they're impervious to it, which surprises me no end. Anyway, that's their lookout. It's not my problem. So, when the spokespersons of the BJP, particularly the ministers, the cabinet ministers, members of the cabinet, suddenly scramble up in difference of what, the, what has happened in the residence of the Chief Justice of India, it actually deepens the suspicion rather than allays it. I wish they had avoided it. It would have been much better uh, if they had refrained from doing uh, this exercise in public. Now, what I have to say is as follows. The reason why this has become a big issue, the reason why so much has been read into this event, which should have been dismissed as a private episode, which is located in the house of an individual, and in all societies, in every nation, in every age, as far as I know from history, it's been assumed axiomatically that what happens in the house of an individual must be treated as purely private and its sanctity, its privacy, its inviolability must be respected and it should not be treated as media fodder. Unfortunately, it has been and I believe that there is ulterior motive in giving it the kind of media visibility that unfortunately this episode has been accorded. That too I wish had been avoided, but it has not been and therefore it has occasioned this nationwide uh, debate, anxiety, controversy. Choose whichever way, whichever word you like for it. But what I emphasize, want to emphasize is this. The reason why this has become a hot spot of controversy is that there is a whole context of hypocrisy surrounding it. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there is hypocrisy in worshipping Lord Ganesha. That's certainly not my meaning. What I mean, mean is that our society is full of hypocrisy. For example, it is certainly downright hypocritical to assume that a human being today can be absolutely dispassionate, objective, unemotional, unbiased, clinical and clinically impartial. I simply don't expect anybody to do so. I don't expect the Chief Justice of India to be completely impartial, though I respect him for his professionalism, I respect him for his intellectual acumen, his capacity to comprehend, to grasp complicated issues, 
his ability to spell out his stand very succinctly and adequately, his very commendable comprehension of jurisprudence, and uh, the adorable, commendable uh, track record uh, that he has maintained so far. There have been occasions uh, that I did not feel particularly inclined to agree with uh, his judgments. For example, the Ayodhya uh, verdict. I don't want to be specific about this. Um, where I, I wish he had taken a different stand. But by and large, um, I have no hesitation in stating publicly that his track record as a judicial officer um, has um, commanded my respect. Um, even so, even from Dr. D. Y. Chandrachud, I don't expect impartiality. I don't expect him to be unemotional, clinically neutral, totally objective and scientific in adjudicating the matters in front of him for the simple reason that no matter what qualifications, what training, what experience Dr. Deva Chandrachud has had so far, he is still a human being. As a human being, he has grown up in our society. He has shared the air and the water and the sun and the culture and the attitude and the social dynamics all of us have. Believe you me, in my 74 years of life on planet Earth, I have not come across one person, one person including myself, who is as objective, unemotionally, clinically impartial as we would expect the Chief Justice of India to be. I don't expect anybody to be impartial. Most of all, I believe that nobody who takes his religion seriously, doesn't matter which religion, nobody who is religiously um, zealous can be impartial because the foremost and the most fundamental training that a religious community imparts to its members is to be partial to that community, to be partial to its interest. Name one religious community which teaches its members to be impartial, objective and rational, just and fair in adjudicating any matter in which the interests of that religion or religious community are involved. Just name one. I have known scores of bishops. I cannot mention one bishop or archbishop or cardinal who can be expected to be impartial in anything that pertains or concerns his religion, his church, his interests. In fact, it would be denounced as disloyalty to the particular church if its interests are not protected even beyond the remit of the law applicable. Every bishop would expect a judge, a Christian judge in particular, to be partial to the interest of the church. Every individual will expect a judge, no matter which court it is, the lowest court to the highest court, to be partial to the interest of that family when he adjudicates, he or she adjudicates adjudicates a matter in which the family interests are involved and so on and so forth. Any organized group will expect its members to act only par with utmost partiality. There is no religious community, there is no organization, there is no institution 
that I know, which exhorts its members to be impartial, to be objective, to be professional in the true sense of the term. Now, to give a little bit of my experience, when I became the principal of St. Stephen's College, I was greatly concerned that for decades, I've, I had known the college from 1971. For all the while that I was associated with the college and for many decades before me that I am aware of, a rivalry between St. Stephen's College and Hindu College was fostered. And it was assumed to be the bounden duty of a Stephanian, a member of St. Stephen's College, to be partial to the college. And that partiality had to be expressed in terms of the contemptuous uh, attitude towards or the dismissive attitude towards the members of the Hindu college. If you are a true Stephanian, you will be partial to your college. And if you are partial to the college, you will have to hold that all others are inferior to you. And I never felt comfortable about it. Therefore, the very first thing I did after assuming office as principal of the college was to walk across and suddenly appear in the office of the principal of Hindu College, which no predecessor of mine, no pr uh, principal of St. Stephen's College before me ever did. The principal of Hindu, Hindu College was shell-shocked. He said, what happened? What happened? He couldn't believe that the, the principal of St. Stephen's College would visit him unannounced. I did so precisely because I had always felt extremely unhappy about and suffocated by the sort of really enthusiastic, zealous promotion of partiality, which I believe is, is bad education. So, this issue has assumed unnecessary gravity, activated unnecessary emotions and anxieties, Precisely because a very wrong, false, unrealistic expectation is posited. The expectation that somebody will be impartial. I don't expect anyone to be impartial. That's, that's my stand. Now, let me give you uh, an illustration. In 1973, when I joined the English faculty of St. Stephen's College as a lecturer, there was an Englishman who joined the same department in the same year. His name was Peter Hiscock, a, a Cambridge educated man, handsome fellow. He was also a priest. He came to work as a chaplain and to teach in the English department. We became very friendly um, and um, uh, we used to discuss many things. So one day he asked me, Wilson, uh, do young men in India expect the women they marry to be virgins. So I was taken aback by that question. I said, of course they do. He said, how stupid. In fact, he used to say the word stupid in a special way. He would say, how stupid. He would say, how stupid. So I, then I asked him, I said, don't you? He said, no. He said, we are all experienced before we marry. If we have to have experience, Shouldn't and wouldn't our women be involved, our girls be involved? If we are not virgins, how can we expect the girls to be virgins? Whereas in the Indian society, we are hypocritical about it. It's all right for men to be footloose and fancy free. But young girls, brides must be virgins. The English people don't entertain this kind of hypocrisy. They are very honest and truthful about it. So in a like manner, I would say, come, let's get real. Let's accept the fact that none of us is impartial. All of us are loaded with a considerable extent of partiality. However, to strike a balance now, the beauty of the legal profession and the beauty of the training that uh, a judicial officer gets is the training to be as 
impartial as is humanly possible. The word humanly is important. As humanly possible. So, I think, I, I sincerely believe that 100% neutrality, 100% objectivity, impartiality, what I call clinical imp impartiality is impossible. I don't expect from, uh, from anyone. The second thing I want to say is that, that said, I believe that Dr. D.Y. Chandrachud is a man of integrity, man of good intentions, uh, even though he has this very strong religious inclination. And I would also assume, though I have no evidence for saying this, I would assume by force of logic that also there is a baggage that goes with this kind of devotion, religious fervor, etc. And I won't grudge him that. That's acceptable and I am willing to leave a big enough mar margin for it. But what I, where I disagree with the Congress spokespersons and all others, some of the uh, senior lawyers practicing the Supreme Court, uh, some members of the Bar Council, Supreme uh, Court Bar uh, Association, etc., who sound alarmed about it, what I want to tell them is this. The Prime Minister visiting the Chief Justice of India on an occasion like this, and conducting puja with him in his puja room is not going to make a very substantial difference. Do you really believe that there is no equation between the Prime Minister and the Chief Justice of India? It will be highly unnatural if there is no equation. The uh, Chief, Chief Justice of India is an important functionary so is the Prime Minister of India. So is the President of India. In the protocol, the Chief Justice of India has a very honorable place. I think he's number four in the protocol. They all belong together. So, I don't believe that something radically new, something that never existed, will suddenly sprout just because the Prime Minister has gone to join the Chief Justice of India in worship at his residence. That equation already existed and it's really natural that such an equation exists. But I would want to believe that Justice D.Y. Chandrachud, the, the, the Chief Justice of India, will have the judicial maturity and professional ethics and professional dignity to rise above the claims imminent in this kind of an equation. So that when he adjudicates matters, particularly matters where the interests of the state are involved, he will not let this particular episode of the Prime Minister making a courtesy call on an occasion like this, joining the Chief Justice of India in an act of worship to upset the scales of justice. Now, let me conclude by saying this, whether or not this was an unfortunate event which should have been avoided, or whether it was only a routine matter about which much hoo-ha is being made for no rhyme or reason, will be proved by the way Mr. Chandra Chud conducts himself in the remaining period, of his, uh, period in office, which is not for long. And uh, whether he obliges the government, the Modi government, with certain key decisions or also in tactfully avoiding the exigency of having to make certain decisions, either way, by omission or commission, if he is seen to be blatantly favoring uh, the Narendra Modi government, which he would not have done had the Prime Minister not visited him on this particular day and conducted the puja in his puja room, then the anxiety, the unhappiness, the criticism, the resentment expressed is well founded. If not, it's completely uh, unnecessary and eminently avoidable. 
Now, there is this saying that Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. Mind you, Caesar's lived almost uh, 1700 years ago, 1600 years ago. If a Caesar were to be alive today and ruling any country, Rome for example, Roman Empire, that Caesar will have to remain a bachelor and die a bachelor because he is unlikely to find a wife who is above suspicion as of today. A contemporary Caesar will have to remain a bachelor and die a bachelor because he is utterly unlikely to find a wife who is above suspicion. That's a reality. Though this phrase is often quoted by people who don't apply their mind. Caesar's wife actually never was above suspicion. That's the reason why in the first place this proverb came into existence. The morality in palace life was not all that foolproof. Palaces were full of intrigues. Anyway, I don't want to go too much into it. But at any rate, the idea that someone can be above suspicion, the idea that a person who holds an important office like the office of the chief justice of India will always conduct himself in a manner that's above the reach of suspicion. These things I don't expect because I, won't, I don't want to romanticize reality. I don't want to be a Don Quixote. You know, the famous... Um, uh, satiric novel by Cervantes, um, uh, 16th century Spain, um, a Spanish classic, 16th, 17th century, who went about um, uh, the uh, chivalric, chivalric task of rescuing damsels in distress uh, in a world that had changed so completely <laughs> that he took the windmill for a giant. And instead of fighting giants, he was fighting a windmill. So it's that kind of reality. The grubby materialism of the 17th century, as opposed to the romanticism of the true chivalric age, which, was, which had gone with the wind. So we are talking about a reality that died a long time ago. I have interacted with so many people, so many people, particularly in the domain of religion, hand on my heart, I tell you, I have not come across a single holy man who is impartial, who is objective, who is committed to justice, particularly justice to others at the expense of one's own vested interests. Every holy man I know in the domain of religion would like the law to be violated, justice to be compromised in order to protect and if possible buttress his vested interests or communal interests or sectarian interests. And yet when it comes to a secular office like the office of the Chief Justice of India, we would expect him to be greater than a saint, completely objective, totally impartial. Forget about it. Such a world doesn't exist. It disappeared a long, long time ago. We talk about constitutional values. We talk about, talk, talk, talk about the high spiritual values of our society, our culture, our great heritage, and etc. Who cares for it? Who cares for it? Name one politician, name one minister who stays loyal to the pledge he takes, swearing on the constitution. Name one person who remains loyal to it. Re name one priest or one bishop who remains loyal to the pledges he takes at the time of ordination or consecration. One? Impossible. So I am realistic about it. Therefore, I don't share the heartbreaks of the Congress party. Nor do I share the sense of anxiety with which the members of the Modi camp suddenly scramble up in defense of what the Prime Minister has done or what happened in the residence of the Chief Justice of India. I think it is a commonplace thing. It has to be dismissed out of hand. Uh, things will happen as they will happen. 
and I say it again, I leave a wide enough margin for bias, for loyalty, because that's the only way things happen in the public domain. It is not a new disease. It's been like this from the very beginning of our organized life. And there's no point in living in a fool's paradise. Let's get real. Jai Hind. Sabko Sanmadi De Bhagavan. Hey Bhagavan. Sabko Sanmadi De.